<clears throat> more or less where I left off. Uh, I spoke in the previous session about a sovereign visitation of the Lord that came to our church in Fort Lauderdale and about the uh, impact that it had and the change in our whole attitude toward prayer. And then I spoke about some kind of birth that took place out of that prayer. And I'd like to build on that now and make some very simple practical suggestions for what I believe God is asking of his church, really, worldwide, at least in what we call the Western world. I think probably in some parts of the third world and in areas of real political oppression, the situation may be somewhat different. Um, I would like to speak about two uh, central thrusts of the purpose of God, intercession and outreach. I've said for many, many years, and I still believe it, that if you want to sum up what God has been doing for his people in this century, the one word that I would choose would be restoration. I believe this has been a century of restoration. And I define restoration as putting things back in the right place and the right condition. And taking an overall view of God's dealings. I personally believe that God has two covenant peoples in the earth. Israel and the church and that for both the 20th century has been a period of restoration putting Israel back in their God-given political geographical inheritance and at the same time putting the church back in its spiritual inheritance and from my point of view, the church has been as far away from its spiritual inheritance in Christ as Israel have from their geographical inheritance in the land. And in many, many ways, the process of restoration is parallel. In fact, I think the church can learn a lot from what has happened to Israel. But I'm not going to dwell on that. I'm going to focus on restoration in the church. I believe it's an unfolding process. It's by far from complete. But if we were to focus on certain areas of restoration, I would say first of all the supernatural power and gifts of the Holy Spirit. I believe that's the thrust that opened the way for restoration. I believe that the New Testament church was supernatural through and through in all its functioning. I tried to check this out once by reading the book of Acts, which has 28 chapters and which I consider to be the New Testament pattern for the church. I don't know of any other. And I I read it to see what would happen if I removed all reference to the manifestly supernatural from the book of Acts. And I discovered this, that not one of its 28 chapters would be left intact, not one. So I conclude that to talk about New Testament Christianity without the manifestly supernatural is an error. There is no such thing. And I believe that a great deal of what God intends to do can only be done on the level of the supernatural. I don't believe the supernatural is a luxury. I don't believe it's like a few extra electronic fittings on a car that you can have if you want to pay a little extra. I believe the supernatural power and gifts of the Holy Spirit are essential for the functioning of the car. And I see this as being the first thrust of restoration beginning in the early decades of this century. I see another area of restoration is spiritual life 
in the houses and homes of God's people. Something that has, generally speaking, accompanied most periods of revival in the church and which was very manifestly present in the early church where the phrase the church in your house is used four times. I believe that also being restored are what we call the ascension gifts or the ministry gifts of Christ to his church listed in Ephesians 4, 11. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. In 1963, in the last church of which I was officially pastor, on Sunday morning I preached a rather long-winded sermon explaining why there could be no more apostles in the church. On that I have one simple comment to make, I was wrong. It's very interesting, most places in the church today people don't hesitate to call a man an evangelist. But they would uh, be very threatened if somebody was presented as a pastor. If you go through the New Testament, you'll find apart from Jesus himself, there was only one man who was called an evangelist. You know who that was? Philip, that's right. I have counted 28 persons in the New Testament who were called apostles. 14 before Pentecost and 14 after Pentecost. So I personally believe that the church was never intended to function without apostles. And it never will be what God intended it to be without apostles. In the book of Acts, the only, or in the whole of the New Testament, the only people who appointed elders were apostles. I'm not going to talk about them. I believe another area of restoration, which I, if I remember rightly, I spoke about when I was last in Christchurch, is the restoration of the message. The restoration of what the gospel is. It's not just the gospel. It's the gospel of the kingdom. It's the message that God is willing to take over the government of the human race. And that his appointed governor is Jesus. You see, the gospel, as we have tended to think of it, is something like this. If you believe in the death of Jesus Christ for your sins, you can be forgiven you can receive eternal life and you can go to heaven when you die. That's all true, it's wonderful, but it's only the first part of the gospel. The gospel takes us out of the kingdom of Satan and into the kingdom of God. And it's designed to make us kings and priests, not in the next dispensation, but here and now. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. He made very careful provision that we would never water down or reduce the content of the gospel. And to the end of this age, that same message is to be proclaimed in all the world as a witness to all nations. Now, having said all that, I'm not going to preach on any of it. Well, not directly. What I believe emerged from God's dealings with us as a congregation last year, and I'm one of those persons, when I see God doing something, I try to give careful attention. I go to my Bible to see what the Bible has to say in that connection and I try to learn what is the lesson that God is trying to teach us. And insofar as I've been able to understand this lesson, I want to share it with you briefly here this morning because I believe myself that this is the direction that God is leading the church in. And I see that the two main practical thrusts that God wants to bring forth from the church are intercession, 
and apostolic outreach. And I want to take a little while to talk about both. If we were to, well, let's put it this way. God has called us to be a kingdom of priests. I'm not going to give you all the scripture references because you're all preachers and ministers and you know them all. But uh, God has called us to be a kingdom of priests. In other words, if you want to be in the kingdom, you have to be a priest. See, the kingdom is for priests. Like if we were talking about a society of botanists, if you wanted to be in the society, you'd have to be a botanist. Or if we were talking about a race of giants, if you wanted to be in that race, you'd have to be a giant. So when we talk about a kingdom of priests, if you want to be in the kingdom, you've got to be a priest. What is the distinctive ministry of the priest? can be summed up in one word. Sacrifice. That's right. In the Bible, the only persons permitted to offer sacrifice were priests. If anybody other than a priest did it, the judgment of God came upon them. King Saul is an example. Now, Peter says, we are called to offer spiritual sacrifices. We are not called to offer the animal sacrifices that were offered under the Old Covenant. What are the spiritual sacrifices that we are called to offer? Let me suggest to you that you can find an outline answer in Hebrews chapter 13 and verses 15 and 16. Hebrews 13 verses 15 and 16. Therefore by him that is Jesus Christ, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name but do not forget to do good and to share for with such sacrifices God is well pleased there are I suppose you could say four sacrifices mentioned praise thanksgiving sharing and doing good and the writer of Hebrews says, those four sacrifices please God. If you look in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, you find another sacrifice that is required of New Testament believers. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. God requires that every New Testament believer presents his body or her body to God as a living sacrifice on the altar of God's service. These are basically the sacrifices of the New Testament priesthood. We could look also, I think, in Hebrews, the seventh chapter, verses 24 and 25. Speaking of Jesus in his heavenly ministry. But because he continues forever, he has an unchangeable priesthood. Notice it's a priesthood. Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Since he ever lives to make intercession for them. What is the priestly ministry of Jesus there? making intercession. So we can kind of round out the picture. Our priestly ministry is first of all the offering of ourselves as living sacrifices to God. Then it's a life of praise, of thanksgiving, of worship, a life of sacrifice and doing good for others. And in a certain sense its consummation is intercession. It's interesting to consider the time span in the life of Jesus. Thirty years of perfect family life, three and a half years of intense public ministry, and almost two thousand years of intercession. I think if we could see that it would give us a different perspective on ministry. Now I want to suggest that 
Within the body of Christ we are all called to be priests, to offer praise and worship, but that there is a very specific calling to be intercessors. You probably heard my wife Ruth say she's called to be an intercessor and I bear testimony to that. Intercession is part of her life breath. She intercedes basically when she breathes. Uh, my first wife, Lydia, had a tremendous ministry of prayer. Uh, she prayed too, as naturally as she breathed, but it wasn't exactly intercession. It was more, I would say in a way, spiritual warfare. What I'm suggesting to you is what I believe the Lord is saying and it's particularly to those of us who are leaders, who are responsible for organizing congregations and the work of the Lord. We need to give much greater priority to intercession. And we need to give much greater scope and recognition to our intercessors. I've heard since I've been here in Christchurch at least three different projects for extending the kingdom of God and I'm sympathetic to every one of them but I believe the ultimate measure of success in each case will be determined by the intercession that's behind them. I would like to take a little picture from the Old Testament. I would like to take the priestly tribe of Levi and the priestly house of Aaron as types of intercession and intercessors. And I want to share with you very briefly the place that was played in the victories that Israel won by the priestly ministry. Just take two examples, very simple ones. Two instances in which Israel won total victories in warfare without a single casualty and without having even to fight. And in each case, the key was the priestly ministry. The first example is Jericho. The ministry of the priests with the ram's horns. We read very quickly in, Jer in Joshua chapter 6. Verses 6 and 7. Now I'm speaking to people who are familiar with the outlines of the story. So it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets and the rear guard came after the ark while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. The priests blowing the trumpets depict a continuous ministry of intercession Prayer, praise, proclamation. Verse 13. The seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. Notice the continuing emphasis on blowing the trumpets. And then in verse 16. And the, se the seventh time they circled the city, it was so when the priests blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And in verse 20, so the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Total victory without a casualty. Where was the emphasis? On the ministry of the priests. All through. Now, 
Let's look at another example of total victory in the time of King Jehoshaphat. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, King Jehoshaphat of Judah was informed that a very large hostile army was advancing against his kingdom and he realized that he did not have the resources to deal with them. And so at the beginning of the chapter, he proclaimed a period of fasting and prayer and called all of God's people together to seek the Lord for his mercy. And then we read in Second Chronicles chapter 20, following on, that after they prayed, one of the Levites gave a prophetic utterance which told them that God would give them the victory and told them the steps they would have to take to achieve the victory. They received divine direction from God through prophecy. And then this is how they obeyed the directions <coughs> and this is the result. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites, and the, I'm reading in Second uh, Chronicles 20, 19. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. And they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord, and those who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army, and they were saying, Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now, when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. So when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were their bodies dead, fallen on the earth, no one had escaped. Again, an absolutely total victory over a vast hostile army. What was the essential ingredient in the victory? It's the ministry of the priests. Uh, I believe that in a certain sense, the lesson for us is that in so far as we understand and release the ministry of the priests, that's how far we'll experience total victory. And I want to suggest to you, on the basis of what I observe in the church in most parts of the earth, that really we are not giving the priests their proper position. We are not giving sufficient recognition to the ministry of intercession. Basically, we make our plans, we have our program, we go on with what we've been accustomed to do, and we ask somebody to pray for us. I'd like to uh, look for a moment at what David experienced. You know the story of his bringing the ark into Zion. And the first time he met with disaster. We look in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verses 7 and following. Uh, we don't have time to go into the details, but we just look at the highlights of this story. 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verses 7 through 10. So they carried the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Ahio drove the cart. Then David and all Israel played music before God with all their might, with singing, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on cymbals, and with trumpets. There's a kind of tendency in the charismatic movement to say that if we praise the Lord loud enough and long enough, we'll get anything we want. This story 
proves that isn't necessarily true. They were praising the Lord with every kind of instrument, very loud, and all they got was a disaster. Verse 9, And when they came to Kidon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and he struck him because he put his hand to the ark and he died there before God. So what was to have been a celebration of victory turned into a funeral. While well, David was a man of God, he didn't give up. He decided there was a lesson to learn and he better learn it. And when he'd learnt his lesson, praise God, he went back. And in First Chronicles 15, Verses 1 through 3, David um, shares the lesson that the Lord has taught him. First Chronicles 15, 1 through 3. Then David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Incidentally, what's the good of bringing the ark if you don't have a place prepared for it? Then David said, No one may carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. And David gathered all Israel together at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place which he had prepared for it. David said, Our mistake was we didn't give the Levites their job. We substituted a new cart for the shoulders of the Levites but the, the ark is to be carried only on the shoulders of the Levites. And then in the same chapter, verses 11 through 16, And David called for Zadok and Abiathar the priests, and for the Levites, for Uriel, Asaiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel, and Aminadab. Then he said to them, <coughs> Excuse me, you are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel to the place I have prepared for it. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us, because we did not consult him about the proper order. How many times would that be true of the contemporary church? We did not consult.